church. Amen. This is indeed a blessed day. Amen. For many, many reasons, it is a blessed day. This is the first time that I've had my wife do the prayer. And I'm very thankful for that. So that is a blessing to me. This is the first time my son has been playing in the church. Amen. And that is a blessing for that. And so I'm very thankful and I'm very humble to uh, all of you because um, this is something that I've prayed about for many, 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 many years. And today it happened. So I'm just excited. <laughs> I'm excited about that um, because when we are faithful and when we are obedient, uh, God answers prayer. Which brings us to why we are here. Today is a day that we are going to talk about prayer. We are praying for them is the title of this. And since we don't need a sermon, uh, I thought that perhaps we would just talk today about the importance of understanding the power of prayer. Before I read the scripture for today, I want to make something clear. And I'm going to say something that may seem a bit excited to some of you. Some of you may not agree with it. It is a very bold statement. But here's my statement. And please forgive me if it offends you. When the church understands the power of prayer, 50% of the work of the ministry will be done. Amen. I'll say that again. When the church understands the power of prayer, half of all the work of the gospel will be completed. Now, why do I say that? Because the Bible says clearly that there are two great commandments. The first one says that we will love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. Amen. The second is like unto it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. The Bible says on these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Amen. So the first part of that is to understand that we need to love our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Amen. And our communication with the Father is through prayer. Amen. Amen. The world that we live in was created by the spoken word. Amen. Everything that God created was created with the spoken word, except one thing. What is the only thing that God created without the spoken word? Amen. Man. Each one of us. Now, why is that significant? Because everything that God created has to obey His will. It doesn't have a choice. A tree doesn't have a free will. A mountain does not have a free will. Everything that God created does not have a free will. Except one. Man. Those of us who are sitting here today. Because we were given a free will. That means one or two things. Either we can live a life of obedience to God, or we can live a life of disobedience. And God will honor whichever one you choose. Either one. We can live for or against Him. Now here's the thing that causes the most confusion. Most people believe that there is something in between. There is a middle ground. But if you believe in the word of God, there is no middle ground. You are either living for him or you're living against him. That is the privilege that we have with a free will. Now I'll tell you something. I am very thankful that I have a church with people in it that believe in the power of prayer. Amen. There are people who can pray in this church. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. Individually, there have been some things that have happened in the last year as a result of prayer. Amen. And I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful that we have a church with people in it that believe in reading the Bible. Amen. Amen. I've been in churches where only a handful of people read the Bible. Everybody else does it. That makes a difference in our prayer life, and it makes a difference in the life of the church because that's the building of our faith. Amen. 
There is a sermon that I did in this church that I said, what is the four things that we need to do to increase our faith? And I'm not going to ask anybody in review today to remember. And I go from four to one. The fourth thing I said we need to do to increase our faith is read our Bibles. Reading the Word of God increases your faith. To believe in the Word of God will increase your faith. The second thing I said that we need to do is you need to be a tithe payer. Now the Bible is very clear in Malachi that if you pay your tithes, what will God do in return? He will not just reward you, or He will reward you in a way that it will not be enough room to receive it. So you must be a tithe payer if you are being faithful to God. The third thing I said that we need to do is you need to become spiritually active. We need to be doing something. If all you're doing for God is coming to church, you are dishonoring Him. Because if we're not spreading the love, what good is it? If you're not spreading the joy, what good is it? If we're not helping somebody, then what good is your faith? Amen. It has to be used. The Bible says faith without works is what? Dead. It's dead. And the dead cannot save anyone. Now we get to the fourth thing I said you need to do to increase our faith. And that is that we need to pray. You need to have a prayer life. We need to be committing sometime during our day for prayer. Amen. Amen. It is our communion with God. And without it, we can do what? Nothing. 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 One thing that Jesus Christ said when he walked this earth is he said that everything he did, he did to the will of the Father. Every decision he made was made with prayer. Everything that he said and did was done in the spirit of prayer. So in order for us to increase our faith, to make our church strong, which it should be, we need to increase our faith by the power of prayer. The most powerful force in the universe is the power of prayer. That's right. And it is something that has been watered down and overlooked to the point where some people are spitting out words out of their mouth that is not prayer. Not Lord. And we're putting God's name on it. Yes, we are not raising the dead. We are not healing the sick. We are not comforting the injured. We are doing nothing but spilling our words out of our mouth. Because if you pray without faith, you are doing nothing. You're helping no one. And you're dishonoring the Spirit of God that's in you. Now, I don't mean to sound harsh to some of you. But we need to understand where we're at. It is rare that we spend 10 minutes in this church to talk about prayer requests. Because the need is so great. So many of us need prayer. Amen. So many of us have burdens on our hearts that can only be comforted by prayer. And the whole power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm saying right now before I read the scripture that I'm making a formal request to this church. I have already spoken to the pastor about this. And he agrees. I have already spoken to the head elder in this church and he agrees. That we will implement corporate prayer in this church. Different than what we have been in the past. And let me tell you exactly what that is. And then I'm going to get to why we got to do it. What it is, is we are going to pray for every member of this church. Individually. Every person who comes to this church regularly will be on the prayer list. And we will pray one person at a time. Now here's how we're going to do this. When you come to church next week and you get your bulletin, I want everybody to start keeping their bulletin because you're going to need it. In your bulletin, it will be called our prayer focus. Our prayer focus will be one family in this church. And for an entire week, for seven straight days, we will pray for that family. Amen. We will mention that family by name. Amen. It's important that you mention by name, that we be specific what we're praying for. We will mention them by name. Their name will be in the bulletin next week. And we will pray. Amen. I specifically will pray at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and at 6 o'clock in the evening. Because if I ask you to do it, i got to do it double. I will pray two times every day for a family in this church. And I'm going to tell you something else. When we pray, before we begin to pray for each other, we've got to have forgiveness. You have got to have forgiveness for your brother or your sister. If you have all against anybody who is sitting in this room, don't leave here without reconciling. 
Because you can't pray out of one side of your mouth and curse somebody out the other side. You can't do that. For this to be effective, we need to forgive each other. And we're going to pray every day. And I'll tell you something else. In the Bible, fasting is associated with prayer. If you don't know what fasting is, come and see me. It simply means that we're going to give up something during our fast. It's usually food. But it can be anything. Anything that your body needs, you deny that of for that particular time. My suggestion is this. If your family is selected for the prayer week, that's the week you should be fasting. Because in order to receive from God, we need to be prepared. The Bible says we need to consecrate ourselves. Consecration means we need to cleanse ourselves. That means you need to have forgiveness. That means you need to put your mind on, on God. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I heard. You could ask people if, you, if, if food, if you're diabetic, you can fast against uh, trying to keep the TV off. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what to fast, but everyone in this church can fast. The only exception is children that don't understand what we're doing. But during the week that your family is selected for prayer, that week you should be fasting. For seven days we will pray for a family in this church. Not families outside of the church. We're talking about the people who are sitting in this room right now. Every one of them. Until every week we're going to change and switch to another family until every family in this church has been prayed for. Amen. 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 Now let me tell you what the results according to the Bible when we pray. Do you realize when we pray together, we are not just simply making a, a spiritual request. See, when we pray together, it's not just a spiritual request. What we are doing is we are extending ourselves spiritually to the Word of God in faith through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is what we are doing. We are exercising our faith. Because we believe prayer changes things. Yes. I hear people say that, but do we really understand what that means? Prayer changes things. It makes a difference in everyone's life. Not just the life of those that are praying for. If you want something done in your home family, if you want to accomplish something, grab a person of faith and start praying. Because the power of the Holy Spirit is ignited, ignited when we pray. And the, the secret, one of the secrets of the universe is the power of when we pray together. We have to pray together. We have to do it in sincerity and every single person can be involved. Every person in the church. My suggestion is very simple. That we have to pray for everybody one at a time. Now I'll show you something else. I want us to go to the scripture for today. John chapter number 15, verse number 7. The Bible says, and I'm reading from the King James Version, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. What does it mean to abide in Christ? To rest in Him. Does everyone know what it means to rest in Christ? And then it adds, in my words. That means we live in accordance with the Word of God. Now, Sometimes people think it requires sacrifice. If you are giving up something that the Bible says we shouldn't be doing anyway, is it really a sacrifice? That's not a sacrifice. Because it's something we shouldn't be doing anyway. So when we're talking about abiding in Christ, abiding in His love, abiding in His Word, we live in accordance with the Word of God. In order for this to be effective, we need to check ourselves spiritually. We need to make sure that we're living in accordance with what our faith dictates. 
If you have some sin in your life that you have not put in check, during our time of prayer, put it in check. Because remember, we have to be consecrated in order for this to work, in order for this to be effective. And consecration means we become clean. We become spiritually clean. Spiritually clean means that we don't do anything that is against the Word of God. Sometimes it will be difficult, particularly when we're faced with our adversary. Anger, frustration, emotion. These are all distractions. So what do we do when we're faced with a dilemma? We pray. Sometimes you're going to have to pray while you're in school, or while you're at the job, or while you're in the marketplace. I've had to pray in public many times. People come to me and, and uh, see something or hear something, and I've got to pray. Because the wrong thing might come out of my mouth if I don't pray. I, I know some of y'all understand. Y'all drive around all day. Somebody get in front of you, didn't bother to use the turn signals. Frustrating, isn't it? If you're not praying, you know, tell them what's going to come out your mouth. We need to put it in our mind to, during the day, be in the spirit of prayer. Amen. See, this is why I said that if the church understands the power of prayer, 50% of the work of ministry would be done. Because if we understood the power of prayer, if we understood how to communicate to our Father, if we understand how to command the elements of the universe based on our faith, then half our work will be done. The only other half is to stand up, to go out there and pray for somebody. Go out there and love somebody. Go out there and help somebody. Go out there and comfort somebody. Most of the time in ministry, we spend more time trying to get ourselves together than we ever have getting somebody else and help some help. Because we got issues right here in the church. We got the devil right here in the church. And we got to spend time excavating him out of here before we can go out there and pray for anybody. Because the Bible says to come boldly to the throne of grace. And coming boldly means we are coming in his name. We're not coming based on what I've done. We're not coming based on what you said or what you did yesterday. We're coming based on the word of God. Does everybody understand? This will affect the entire church. One person at a time. When we exercise our faith, when we start praying for each other, not just, and here's, here's, here's what I'm, I'm going to suggest. In the past, and, and, and I'm not beating anybody up, I'm just telling you the truth. In the past, when we pray for somebody, if somebody calls the church or calls one of the elders and requests prayer, here's what, here's what they do. They say, okay, look, Jimmy, Here's your prayer. Lord, help little Jimmy. Strengthen little Jimmy. Bless little Jimmy and his family. Amen. Goodbye. That's his prayer and that's done. Maybe we do it again another week. Now what's wrong with that? Is that faith? If it's done in faith, we do it until we see the results. Until God answers your prayer, you keep praying. The Bible says pray without ceasing. So what we're going to do is exercise praying without ceasing. But when we do it, we will expect results. Amen. Amen. We will expect something to take place. Because when God spoke the world into existence, as soon as the words left, something happened. There was no delay. Sometimes your delay in prayer is a lack of faith. People assume that it's the will of God. But it's a lack of faith. Because the Bible says, if you pray and you believe, then it's going to happen. Some of us pray, and when it doesn't happen, we can, so we can see it happening. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. It means because we didn't see it. We believe that it didn't happen. And we think it's something wrong with the prayer. Or something wrong with the person doing the prayer. The Bible is clear that we need to increase our faith. And by praying, 
is the first aspect of increasing our faith as a church. Because the Bible says one sins a thousand. How many does the Bible say two sins? Ten thousand. What about three? You would think it would be ten thousand more, wouldn't you? Wrong. See, spiritual math is not the base ten system. If we get three people praying, it sends a hundred thousand demons out of here. Imagine if we had a whole church praying. And I'm not talking about just here in the sanctuary. I'm talking about why you're at your job. Now let me ask you, and I just want you to just raise your hand. How many people in the last year, within the last 12 months, have seen any kind of miracle from God? Now whenever I look around, half the church said we've seen a miracle from God. If we pray as a church, everybody's hand will be raised, both of them. Because it will affect everybody. No matter how much you did yesterday, or how much you think you lost yesterday, or where you're starting out from. See, that is the greatest thing about the joy of the Lord. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. That means it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you believed yesterday. Today is the day of what? Of salvation. So it begins today. Everybody leaves with a clean slate. If you have faith. Nobody has to look and say, well, i got to clean up my closet. Your closet was clean when you walked in the door. This is the throne of grace. You can't be here unclean. All we need to do is exercise the faith that's already in us. And we can make something happen. Our church needs to be larger. We all can't fit in the, the fellowship hall. That's one thing we need to be praying about. We feed homeless people in this church. There are times when we run out of food. And we still got people that's hungry. What are we going to do? We need to pray. Our pastor is faced with burdens that are very beyond him. Some of us know about some of these burdens, some of us don't. But our pastor has faced a lot of burdens. What are we going to do? We're going to pray. We've lost some members. Some in the past week. We need to pray. We have a church that has a desire to serve the people that come here with pamphlets. We need to pray. Of all of the ministries is in this church. And it's sometimes amazing that what you can do with so little people. It's amazing what happens when we exercise our faith. If I saw repetition, yes, it's repetitious. Because we need to increase our faith. And we're going to do it one family at a time. That means the oldest person in here is, I don't know, Bob, or I don't know if anybody is older than him. The youngest person in here is one of my kids probably. Every one of them. I teach my children how to pray. In fact, do you know why children are so precious in the Bible? Does anybody know why? Why are children so precious? They're teachable. You can teach because why? They're willing to be teachable. Because of their faith. A child will believe anything. In fact, the Bible says if you do not come as a child, you will in no way enter the kingdom. Children believe anything. I'll give you an example. One of my children. They came to me one day with one of their dolls. And she said to me, she said, Daddy, will you fix my doll? Now the head came off. And you know, I can't melt plastic. I said, I can't fix this. She said, oh, yes, you can fix it. You can fix anything. I'm like, well, who told you that? She said, you did. <laughs> so we didn't believe anything. That's a true story. And I said, well, I realized I, that's not what I meant. I can't melt plastic together. But children believe anything. That works positive and it works negative. We know what happens when you teach children negative. It's, it's terrible. I've seen a report where, where uh, some students were fighting in the school. And, it, and two of the teachers stood by and watched it. Did nothing about it. That's on the news right now. 
That's a shame. We need prayer. Amen. And so children have tremendous faith. The difference between their faith and our faith is that our faith has been beat down by the worldliness. Amen. Our faith has been, people have told us what we can't do. Well, I'm going to turn that around today, what you can do. Because the Bible says through Christ, how many things are possible? Oh. All things are possible. And all of these ministries in the church need help. All of the people who are here in the church, even people who regularly visit this church who are not members, need help. Yes. We're obligated to help them, aren't we? Yes. Don't we love them? Amen. Did I lie when I said this church has love in it? They need help. And guess who is in a position to help? You are. All of us. Because what they need the most is what we have least to give them. We need to release the power of the Holy Spirit in this church. We have done, we have gone too long without it. Too many of us are praying by ourselves. Too many of us in small groups are, are, are blessing other people. We need to do it as a church. And if we do, then every person in here will benefit in the results. Now if you would, Turn to Job 42, 10. Job chapter 42, verse 10. And I want to make a request that somebody read it for me. Somebody read it out loud so everybody can hear it. Job chapter 42, verse 10. Who can read it for me? Ricky, volunteer. Thank you. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the mm. Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Isn't that something? When Job prayed for his friends, God gave him twice what he had. Amen. Some of us need something extra. If we take our focus off ourselves and put it on our brothers and our sisters, <coughs> Then what does the Bible say God will do for what I need time? He will multiply. And I like multiplication. Especially spiritual multiplication. Because spiritual multiplication is not 2 plus 2 equals 4 or 2 times 2 equals 4. four. That's not spiritual multiplication. Spiritual multiplication says tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. <coughs> So when we're praying for our friends or our brothers and our sisters, our needs are being met in faith. That's all I'm asking you to do. Is to pray for your brother or your sister in this church. Reconcile yourself first. Be cleansed. But take time out in one day, every day, to pray for a family in this church. Amen. Can we do that? Amen. Just pray for them. It would even help if you called them up and said, listen, I know you don't know me. I'm just a brother in the church. I just want to know, can I pray for something for you? Because we need to pray specifically. We need to be specific as possible what we're praying for. If your brother or sister needs something, say, I want you to pray for you. Every day. I will do it at 12 o'clock noon and at 6 o'clock in the evening every day. It makes a difference if we do it together. But I'm not saying when you pray. And remember, whoever the person, whoever the family we, that shows in the prayer, that week you should be fasting. If you have any problem or any questions about your fast, come and see me. I'll help you. So I want everybody, when, we, when you come to church next week, just look in your bulletin. And then say prayer focus, and whoever the family is will be on that prayer, on that prayer focus. Does that mean we're going to stop praying for the people on the prayer list? 